So team, in this episode, I'm excited to be introducing Mason Barrett. He's a recent HBS grad who's now looking for his first acquisition as an independent sponsor. I was introduced to Mason via Mary Reed on the ski slopes, unfortunately, because he's a much better skier than me. I really had to check my ego. But um, Mary's a, another Harvard grad turned PE professional and actual regular contributor to ASM's private equity content, which is awesome. But in this episode, we're talking about independent sponsors. So let's dive in. Mason has already made the leap. He decided as a first year MBA student, is that right? Yeah. And uh, so as a first year MBA student decides he wants to pursue the independent sponsor path, which as concisely as possible is decision to go out and look for a company to buy for yourself. Uh, what many people refer to as acquisition entrepreneurship. So Mason, thanks for joining. Delighted to have you on. Thanks for bringing me on. So I'd like to start just diving into your background a little bit, the evolution and how you got to kind of the real catalyst of deciding this is the path you want to pursue. Sure. So I'd say, you know, I think a lot of people in the MBA program at HBS or in any other uh, MBA programs have really interesting and diverse backgrounds. And Mine was a little bit of a snapshot of several different common ones in that I started my career as an officer in the Navy. I spent a couple of years in the Naval Special Warfare training pipeline. I spent some time in management consulting at McKinsey, and then I spent a bit of time as an operator uh, building and then leading a product development team at a PE-owned action sports and entertainment company. So I've done the public sector, the consulting, the operator, and the private sector, um, Can you go a little bit into which company that was? Because I know I know which one, and it's kind of fun. Uh, sure, sure. It's it's I fly indoor skydiving. Yeah. Uh, so headquartered in in Austin, it's the vertical wind tunnel that you see in just about every major city these days, uh, serving kind of two key markets or two key demos. One, the type of people who will never ever jump out of a plane, no matter what the circumstances or how much you pay them, the plane might be on fire. They're staying in and taking their chances, getting wheels on the ground. And then the other, which is kind of the camp that I fell into is the active skydiver looking to improve their skills. Sure. Uh, so I got into skydiving back in my Navy days, got introduced to the tunnel, used that as a training tool. And this was just a phenomenal opportunity when KSL bought iFly several years ago now to combine you know, a professional opportunity and a huge personal passion. Sure. For an adrenaline junkie who likes finance, it's almost perfect. <laughs> it, it was ideal at the time. Yeah. Um, uh, so right. in all those, yeah, so in all those roles and kind of how this connects to ETA, entrepreneurship through acquisition, I've just slowly walked my way to smaller and smaller organizations. You know, you go from multi-million person across active duty and civilian and reservist in the DOD to McKinsey has a large global footprint, north of 10,000 uh, know, professional consulting services staff and quite a few more support. And then iFly, I believe at the time, had about 1,000 frontline personnel and somewhere between 150 and 200 corporate employees. And I've really enjoyed the, the impact that I've been able to have and the direct influence I've been able to have over a team or even over the direction of a company as I move into those small smaller organizations at a higher level of seniority. Um, so one of the things that drew me to ETA was just natural evolution of that moving smaller in size and higher in, in responsibility and ability to affect change for an entire organization. Sure. Kind of recognition of more autonomy with scale is. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Which I think is also like highly entrepreneurial, which I think lends itself to becoming an independent sponsor as well. You have to be, you have yeah. to be comfortable with some the fact that you have autonomy and uncertainty, I think. Autonomy, uncertainty, and some level of risk. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, so let's talk a little bit about kind of the approach to doing this. You're, you're kind of pulling yourself out of a job. Um, you don't have income for a certain period of time. There's generally two approaches that people think of. It's uh, the self-funded or the search fund model. You want to speak a little bit to those approaches and why you decided on the, on the approach you're taking? Sure. So, so I did spend a lot of time uh, on the front end before one, diving into ETA, and then two, before deciding on my specific path within ETA, uh, just getting smart on the ecosystem. So there are books, web resources, seminars. Uh, what, what have been was, a couple of your favorites for, for people listening in? What should they absolutely pick up if they're going to? Sure. Two so this is... Questions? Yeah, this is, this is cheesy. I, I swear Rick and Royce are not giving me any kind of uh, royalties for this, but I did bring 
Brought it on. HBR yes. guide to buying a small business. Uh, so I say Rick and Royce. This is Professor Richard Ruback and Professor Royce Yudkoff. They are the ETA, the search fund professors at HBS. They literally wrote the book on it and have been teaching a class at HBS for, I think, well over a decade That's at true. this point. Um, so their book is a phenomenal resource. I read that. Uh, I think my wife got it for me my first month of starting the MBA program. And I read that. And I think I actually snuck out of one of my first year classes to attend one of their classes ah, um, cool. <laughs> with the, with the caveat that they said I wasn't going to get them in trouble. Yeah. Um, Jim Sharp is another HBS connected. He's a former professor, uh, now an entrepreneur in residence and mentor. Uh, he runs a blog. I believe it's jimsteinsharp.com. Uh, that, that blog is fantastic. Searchfunder.com is, is another great place to get a little bit of education on the space. So I'd say those three were, were pretty valuable early on. And then the MBA programs at, at HBS and the GSB especially have just a phenomenal support system and ecosystem built around entrepreneurship through acquisition, you know, self-funded search, search funds and independent sponsor models. Uh, so there are clubs, mentorship sessions, learning sessions, ways to connect with other people, um, to spend a lot of time doing all those activities as well. Yeah. So it's, it's an isolated here, profession until you close. So it's great to be aware of the networks and resources that kind of can give you a little sanity while you're, while you're looking. Um, yeah. And one of the, and one of the really nice things I found is that, that search fund, uh, and associated entrepreneurs in general have been really generous with their time, you know, so as, as someone who they didn't know at all, no personal connection, maybe not even a school or a military or a McKinsey connection, just said, hey, I'm interested in this, this unique brand of entrepreneurship and your name got floated to me. Can we chat for 15 minutes? Yeah. And the, the responses were, were overwhelmingly positive. So That's if you can find search fund entrepreneurs, they'll, they'll likely give you a little bit of their time as well. Uh, but you asked, I think about... Oh, yeah, all that research and exposure... <laughs> Back to all that research and exposure. (laughs) Yeah. The way that I kind of made my decision was, do I pursue this, this path in general? Is this the right thing for me, given my background, my skill set, my goals, um, kind of future professional interests, all of that. That's my first little decision node, a little yes, no off that. And then if so, how to go about it. And in general, I'd say there's two or maybe two and a half uh, core modalities in this world, basically the independent sponsor slash self-funded model or the traditional funded model. And I'd say the 0.5 there is there are uh, kind of modifications on the traditional model that are basically search accelerators that are a little bit more concentrated in your, in your capital raise and who you're going to work with. So what, but in what, general, what are the main uh, distinguishing factors between those two? Sure. I'd say big distinguishing factors are first, how you go about looking for a company in a, in an independent sponsor model, there is no one paying your bills. Um, You are doing this essentially out on an Island. You're doing it by yourself. You may be able to acquire or assemble some advisors and some helpers, maybe grab some interns. Um, But you're basically doing the work by yourself and you have to find a way to obviously survive and provide for yourself and potentially for your family uh, during the time that you're looking for a company. In the traditional model, you will raise somewhere around, call it 300 to 500 grand of walking around money. And that will enable you to pay yourself a salary and to be able to afford you know, additional systems, tools, processes, personnel uh, to facilitate the search, uh, the search phase. Uh, so that's, that's, I think, one of the biggest, most defining characteristics. And when, and and, when you raise that money, just to go the last step, when you raise that money, the, the search backer, as they're called, the people providing you this capital, mm-hmm. what, what are they entitled to because they gave you three to 500,000? Sure. So they're entitled to several things. I think the, the first thing that they're most interested in is that they get right of first refusal to invest in a pro rata share in your deal. So say you raise 500 grand, an individual investor or an institutional investor provided you $100,000 of that 500, they are then entitled to invest one fifth or up to 20% of the equity injection in your ultimate deal. Uh, they, they're not compelled to do that, but they have the ability to do that. The second piece 
is I believe it's market standard now that they get a 50% step up in the search capital. So that search capital, that 500 grand that they gave you to facilitate your search transforms or becomes 750,000 of equity in, in the search deal. And then finally, I think there are you know, quite favorable economics for, uh, for search investors and for search entrepreneurs, frankly. Um, so they get to participate in these deals that historically as an asset class is underwriting, I think somewhere between 33 and 35% IRR over a 30 plus year lens of study. Right. Yeah. When yeah. it works, so, it works really well. Yeah. When it works, it works really well. When it doesn't, uh, you know, it's a, it's a fairly or relatively de-risked way for an individual entrepreneur to pursue this path. Yeah. You know, you, you go out as an independent sponsor and you look and look and look for a year and a half, two years, or you know, God forbid, even longer, and you don't ultimately successfully close on an acquisition. You've just spent two years of your life making no money and in <laughs> fact, spending money. Um, how do you, know, you prepare yourself for a, that? That's another question I really wanted to dive into just like mental preparation, how you think about, you're going to be grinding through calling, uh, calling on founders, owners, CEOs, CFOs, trying to find a way into a company. And, uh, you just mentioned before the call that you've had a few calls today and, you know, some of them ended up <laughs> kind of dead ends and that's, yeah. that's part of it. That's, you have to be turning over so many rocks looking for the, the perfect acquisition because you're also, it's your, the, the, the biggest challenge is you're taking someone, a company that someone's built over decades and you're mating your future with it. So there's a lot of concern on both sides of the equation, which means there's a lot of reasons it can fall apart. So it's perfectly natural that they do. How do you think about being like mentally tough and prepared and knowing that you're going to be doing this for, I mean, sometimes you get lucky, but I think average is 12 to 18 months. I think it's actually slightly longer. I think the oh, average is yeah. about 20 months. To being <laughs> yeah, I would love to make an acquisition in less than 12 months. That would be <laughs> I'd be singing and dancing. Uh, so just a, just a couple things on this front. Um, one is I hear no probably 50 times more than I hear yes. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, the, the call that you're talking about this morning was one of several where folks registered some interest, set up time to talk, um, easily could have said no via email and <laughs> we get to a phone call and I said, yeah, first five minutes, I'm never selling my business. I just wanted to see what you were about. Okay. You know, that's, yeah. that's fine. They're just um, sort of flattered that you're interested and they want to know what you think. That... <laughs> something, something like that. Or they said, you know, I get these emails all the time. Yours was better than most. So <laughs> I, I thought you deserved a little, little pat yeah. on the back. Um, yeah. In general, a bit of mental toughness, a bit of knowing what you're going into, uh, I think is, is the balance there mm -hmm. is as, as I was doing all that advanced preparation, you know, reading the books, attending the classes, talking to current and former searchers or independent sponsors across all levels of tenure and success, um, talking to my family, uh, having lots and lots of detailed conversations with my wife about was this going to fit our joint professional goals? Was this going to fit our joint family goals? Um, just making sure that you've got a really solid unvarnished view of what the life is like. Sure. Is, is, I think, very helpful. Uh, so you really know what you're signing up for. And on the, on the mental toughness side, um, I mean, having, having gone to Bud's and done, yes. the, done the SEAL training. <laughs> done it to the extreme. Admittedly, um, unsuccessfully. Um, <laughs> just having been in that environment and having been subjected to some of those challenges, I think helps me contextualize a lot of things. Sure. Say like, hey, yes, I'm hearing no all the time. Yes, I'm still not actively drawing a salary. I don't have something that's on the verge of closing right now, but I'm warm. I'm yeah. dry. I slept yeah. eight and a half hours last night. I'm I'm still pretty happy. Yeah, you've explored and then in, in more extreme ways, other ways. Yeah, and then I think I think it's also helpful just as the final piece, preparing of, in terms of preparing for this grind of turning over lots of rocks, hearing lots of no's, finding lots of times when you're not a good fit um, is just keeping in mind what the end goal is. And the end goal is not just doing this for five years, 10 years, and continually trying to make acquisition after acquisition and living in this phase. It's actually getting into a company. It's providing a path to liquidity or providing a succession plan uh, or a path to retirement for a successful entrepreneur. It is making sure that you're maintaining and preserving 
the livelihoods of the several to potentially several dozen people or even several hundred people working for them. It's enabling a huge, huge level of personal and professional agency to have control over what you're working on as a professional and to be able to craft the kind of life that you want to live that you can, in my opinion, really only functionally do as an entrepreneur. And then there's always, you know, you can read the Stanford study for a little bit more detail, but there's always the, you know, the personal financial reward aspect of that. And I think, I don't know if this is your quote or a quote that you, you know, borrowed from somebody else, but I liked it. It stuck in my head. You know, nobody sets out on an entrepreneurial path planning on going broke. Yeah. <laughs> and there are, yeah, I think the, I think the kind of longitudinal study and the averages show that this is a, a great career path for similarly minded and similarly skilled folks with military backgrounds, consulting backgrounds, um, banking, private equity backgrounds, um, just on, on the law of averages. But then there's always these lights out stories and these lights out studies that, that occasionally happen through the entrepreneurship through acquisition model. Not that that is my guiding star by any, by any means, but they're sometimes an interesting, um, interesting story to keep in the back of your head. Yeah. I think anything that has, uh, potentially strong upside from a career perspective, but also has that X factor potential. It's just more exciting in general. I mean, it's, you're not banking on it, but the fact that that exists is, is exciting. Um, which I think gets us into our next category. So investment thesis, what, what exactly are you looking for and, and how are you narrowing your search? Yeah. So I am, we might as well start with what makes a good down the fairway search or down the fairway independent sponsor acquisition when you don't have an incredibly detailed and technically centric background. You know, if I had spent a decade of my life in oil and gas versus a banker, then as a, then on the buy side, then in operations for a while, I would probably be looking for an oil and gas business. Sure. But, very industry specific. Yeah. But for someone who has a more broad background and kind of skill set that they've accumulated across pretty different industries and pretty different functions, there is this model built on the model of um, Irv Grossbeck, who's a professor at Stanford GSB and expanded by Rick and Royce, professors Rubeck and Yedkoff. Um, model's been around for a while and it basically maximizes the chances of success for a young to mid-career entrepreneur looking to make a successful acquisition. Um, so I'm guided by that, which is basically looking for a company in the five to 30 million top line range, 750K to probably 3 million in EBITDA range, something that is non-cyclical or potentially counter-cyclical, low capital intensity so that its cash flowing characteristics are strong, low customer concentration, and high quality of revenue. And by that, I mean, you know, the ideal would be high recurring revenue, but at a minimum, a consistent and predictable trend of repeat purchase. Um, so what that sure. tends to look like is a lot of B2B and B2G services. And what it tends to not look like is e-com, direct to consumer, you know, brick and mortar retail, construction, auto, um, heavy industry, oil and gas. In addition to all those kind of strict financial characteristics, I am looking for a, a business that's at a certain moment in time. So there can be certainly businesses that meet all of those criteria in terms of size, cyclicality, industry, character of revenue, but their, their owner obviously, or maybe not obviously at first, but their owner has no interest in selling, or the owner has family members who are in the business who intend to stay in the business, um, or they have a very well-defined succession plan already that doesn't involve outside capital, doesn't involve the need for a new leader of this business whenever they retire. Sure. Um, but yeah, also I think one of the, one of the driving forces or driving characteristics behind what I'm looking for is filling a different niche. And that's, uh, you know, there's, there's more, more money than I think either of us can, can really quantify or imagine. Distinguishing yourself from the capital base is yeah. one of the most difficult things right now. Yeah. And in the lower middle market, private equity world. So finding something that had where there, I've got something unique to tell or a unique value proposition to them about how I will handle the business in the future and how that is differentiated from a lot of conventional PE shops. 
or just playing in a in a size range or an industry where there's not been a lot of of interest in in legacy buyers, legacy mm-hmm. financial buyers. Absolutely. And and on that front, I th- and I think those combine a little bit. I, th- I think what you're speaking to now and the idea of uh, a business without a succession plan where the entrepreneur is really attached to the business is also something where they might be looking for someone who has kind of a longer term plan. Um, I, I've seen that. It's rare. A lot of people are just looking for the largest buyout, but occasionally you do find people who want to know that their employees and these stakeholders outside of the shareholders really are cared for. So I, I think those things can combine sometimes. Yeah, and that's, and that's honestly one of the first questions that I ask. Uh, both to to entrepreneurs and business owners directly, or to intermediaries, business brokers, um, M and A advisors, et cetera, of what what is this person's goal for a transaction? Wow. What are their important. what does an ideal transaction look like for them? What are the you know factors driving their concern or fa- sure. driving their consideration? And is it just who's going to cut the fattest check, or are there a laundry list of you know, company cultural things at play, protections for their employees at play, um, just other things about the the long-term sustainability and health of the business. And I found that, you know, on the on the whole, at least the the folks that I've interacted with, it has not just been who's going to cut me the biggest check. These I think these you find it more in the lower middle market than anywhere else has been yeah. my experience across lower middle market, middle market, and upper middle. I've never worked in the mega fund category, but I'm certain it's true there. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I bet. But I think these, um, these businesses just get commingled with the, the personality yeah. and the, the reputation and the community standing of this individual so that it's impossible to just suck those out and separate them. And they know sure. that this business is going to be associated with them on a longer term. So they want to see it continue to succeed and you know, right, wrong, or indifferent. Um, they have a point of view on who is going to help enable that success. Yeah. And it's, it's my goal to find those that, that believe in me and believe in what I'm doing. So on, on the flip side, you have kind of what bankers and entrepreneurs are looking for out of you. Um, on the flip side, they want to know that, you know, you're someone who can close, has been speaking to investors, has a capital base that's interested. And I think one of the most frequent emails I get on the topic of independent sponsors through ASM is how do you look for the deal and raise capital at the same time? And you can't speak to either side concretely. You, you don't quite have the deal yet. You know, so it's like, why are you speaking to capital providers and vice versa? Um, and it's interesting because being an entrepreneur is just having faith that your efforts and confidence will bring everything to the finish line sort of simultaneously. So just be curious to your take on that. Yeah, I think the, the successes of people who have come in the, the kind of generations of ETA before have have really made it pretty straightforward for me and my generation. And by that, I mean, this model, this modality of, of buying a business has, has been around for quite a while now. And it's got a really strong proven track record. And that strong proven track record, I think has helped encourage bankers, has helped encourage institutional investors and other high net worth individuals to really support and believe in it such that I have no doubt at all about my ability to close a transaction. And I can usually communicate that pretty effectively to a business owner or to an intermediary. Um, I'll give a quick plug and a quick shout out to, to Live Oak Bank and say that they're the, you know, the number one SBA lender in the country. And they are phenomenally helpful in helping develop and support this, this ecosystem of independent sponsors or search funders. Um, they provide a lot of time and they provide letters of support that indicate they have already pre-screened and vetted you. They know your background, they know what you're looking for, and they are prepared to finance a deal uh, that you that you bring them, basically meeting the parameters that you've already discussed. And then on the equity side of the house, there is, I think, similar to similar to private equity, there is a lot more money available than there are quality businesses and quality deals such that if you can get a bank to, to underwrite your deal, the equity raise is not going to be a significant challenge. Um, That's right. so I think, I think, there's, yeah, no I think even, there's no even institutions that look for precisely you, basically, right? Their objective is to raise a fund and then go find independent sponsors and only, only fund independent sponsors. So I think it has broadened an appeal. And so long as you're kind of talking to people along the way, the idea that you wouldn't be able to get the capital generally 
generally pretty unlikely if yeah. you have an attractive and opportunity. Yeah. And that's, and that's not necessarily to be dismissive of the, you know, the concerns of, of an individual business owner or of an m a advisor, uh, because they, I'm sure they do encounter lots of people who are just kicking the tires, who don't necessarily have the same set of professional experiences, same set of educational experiences, same you know, group of potential investors whom they have been engaging with for you know, potentially their entire career, or at least the, the period of time that they've been dedicated to preparing to, to launch an independent sponsor, sponsor search. For sure. Um, I, I mean, I, I worked in a position where we were funding independent sponsors uh, once, and it was interesting because if, uh, if the individual came prepared, really knew what their plan was from kind of LOI to close, understood the due diligence process, knew their third parties, et cetera, and has something that we didn't consider market, the idea that, I mean, we were generally competing with other groups to get involved. Um, occasionally, we did see people who had somehow secured something under LOI, and it didn't really make a lot of sense. But most of the time, if you've been doing the work correctly, it's, it's attractive to institutional capital. Yeah. And I think where the, maybe the biggest knowledge gap is here is for individual business owners, is less so for M&A advisors and business brokers, is that they, you know, they have run a phenomenally successful business in their industry, in their niche. They may not have been exposed to this, this world of, of small firms, yes. transactions, or this process before. So I might say, yes, I've got a Rolodex of four or five dozen uh, either people or firms who are interested in supporting me, and I'll call that list based on who is the right fit for the right company. They can just e just as easily roll their eyes and say, "Yeah, sure, show me the list yeah. or show me letters." And and that's something that I've done occasionally. It's not something that I've felt like I had to lead with, um, but sometimes they have said, "Hey, this is a larger deal. This is something that would." would take potentially a significant amount of our time, effort, and energy. So we want to know that you're serious. Can you provide some, some letters of support, both from debt and equity partners? Okay, for, Unfortunately, for, I've got some. For people but, listening, can you describe a, a letter of support? Very short. It is yeah. less, than, less than one page, basically company letterhead or personal letterhead saying, I am so-and-so at such-and-such -such bank. Mason and I have had lengthy conversations. I understand his professional background and his goals in completing a transaction. We're prepared to support him in a transaction with enterprise value That's right. from five to 20 million or yep. whatever it may be. Similar from an equity side is I have gotten to know Mason since we worked together at McKinsey or I've gotten to know him while teaching him as a professor at HBS. I regularly make private investments in the amount of up to 200,000, 500,000, a million, whatever it may be. Uh, I am interested in reviewing any and all deals that he brings my way. Sure. It's yep. literally That's just right. a couple of sentences. Um, it's funny the confidence it gives. I mean, it's, it's like a paragraph on a signed piece of paper and somehow it can advance your position in, in a process. I've always found it a little interesting that that's all it takes, but yeah. private equity to some degree is a confidence game. So, or to yeah. a degree. <laughs> yeah. So moving on, let's, let's talk a little bit about how, how you're looking. I, I understand you've, um, reached out, uh, I think built a team of interns or maybe have an intern, but just sourcing strategy in general, what you found uh, works for you and, and what you found is effective. Sure. So I do have a, a small team of interns. I've got, uh, let's see where are they all distributed. Uh, one at Duke, one at Wharton undergrad, one at UT and one at U of U. So you how, how'd you identify them? them? Uh, it was a mixture of sources. I'd say I got a handful of, of personal referrals folks I've either worked with previously, mentored, taught in some kind of other context who still maintain closer connections to their undergraduate school. They gave me a couple of personal referrals, but the two biggest sources were searchfunder.com. I'm, I'm really amazed by how forward-looking and forward-thinking this new generation of undergrad students are. Because mm -hmm. 10 plus years ago, I didn't know anything about an independent sponsor model or a search fund. And now there's dozens, if not hundreds, of undergraduate students looking for internships or kind of offering their services on that website. Yeah. And then there's a great uh, cross-platform university recruiting tool called Handshake. And once you go through the hoops to be verified, they know you're a real business. They know you're you know, complying with all of the, the various universities, recruiting regulations. You can post basically a job listing to multiple schools at once mm -hmm. and get resumes back. That's fantastic. So, 
walk through that whole Amazing that result. whole process. It means yeah, the competition is going to step up in a generation or two. It's going to be yeah. I mean, not that the competition is already not steep in the P in the P world, but it has it has exploded in the in the search or independent sponsor world just over the past couple of years that I've been aware and trying to get get educated on it. Absolutely. It's, it's amazing how much more interest there is now versus even 12 months ago. Entirely. Um, so how, how do you work with, uh, how do you work with your interns to source deals? Yeah. So my interns don't exclusively work on sourcing. I do have a kind of bigger intern program for them where they're getting more out of the experience than just deal sourcing. They do some deal analysis and deal memo work. We've got a pretty robust professional development curriculum. Um, but where they, where they plug in, on sourcing is typically heavy on company research. So I will provide them with a list of companies that I've already identified on the front end, either screening through PPP databases, going through local chambers of commerce listings, going through government contractor websites that you know publish lists of publicly available uh, government contract awardees, any number of potential screening methods to find a list of just, this is every company in this field, in this location uh, that I could find. And then I set them off to do the research on honing down industry, gaining information and insights on ownership structure, making sure that it's not already private equity owned, that it's not already a subsidiary of another company. It doesn't market itself as a startup uh, because I'm looking for an established business. It doesn't have venture funding associated and then providing me so no, an no, interesting... no institutional capital and a certain level of profitability kind of uh, that no PE, no VC mm-hmm. um, proof of concept, any other proof items on your uh, Yeah, absolutely. So I want to see at least five years of operations. So something that has, has been running for, for some time, I would obviously prefer to see 20 or 30 years in operations sure. or even 50 or hundred. Uh, but I don't want to don't want to cut the list too short. Uh, do tend to want to see at least a some type of employee presence on LinkedIn. Uh, so just another way to screen another proxy method that you can use for size or profitability is really just trying to make sure that I'm not doing a ton of unsolicited outreach to one stop shop or one man shops, sure. one man or one woman shops, uh, where somebody has built a successful business but they are basically a sole proprietor. Uh, that's that's not something that's within the within my scope and let's see what else am i i think that that just about covers it and then i'll ask them in addition to doing all of those screening methodologies and trying to verify contact information and trying to help me get a little bit of market intelligence on the company and on the individual uh just kind of test them with writing a short note on that on that company so this is something I found distinctive about this company and hopefully that'll help me facilitate. That'll jog my memory or that'll actually push me on my own little research journey and investigative journey on getting more information on this company and deciding to, to engage in outreach and then giving me a little, little something extra to talk about if, and when I'm fortunate enough to get the business owner on the phone. Sure. Terrific. So what, what is your process for getting the business owner on the phone? Constantly evolving, constantly, constantly evolving. Um, in general, my putting my first foot forward is is via email, and I've got a a short sequence that I deploy. It's not just a one and done. I fire off an email. They they call me back or they don't, and all oh, shucks, that's it. Uh, it's a short sequence where I'm reaching out first via email, and then in quick succession after that, sending a couple not not spam level, but just a couple of, of short follow-up spam. emails, LinkedIn connection, and then just cold calling the business. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've got a little kind of tracker, a little software suite that helps keep me up to date on following the steps of that sequence and following the proper timing of that sequence. So and I was informed by a, yeah, I was informed by a, an entrepreneurial sales class that I took in the MBA. That was something that's still pretty far outside of my skill set. As you think military McKinsey and then product development, I didn't do a lot of sales. Mm-hmm. I did basically yeah. no sales other than internal, if internal If it's not if it come naturally to you, it, it is, it is hard. I mean, there's people yeah. with great technical skill sets and you put them in front of others and they just, they don't like it. You know, there's a natural <laughs> aversion. 
Uh, I'm not saying that's yeah. you. I, I've, I've had that struggle before. I think, um, and honestly, getting into the industry and, and doing that abroad was my first lesson in having to sell myself super, super hard. Mm -hmm. And it's a, it's a skill set that carries you, but it developed for me in the most unnatural way easily. So I understand yeah. that. And, and, that's, and that's certainly a, a big component of my job and how I'm thinking about it. It's interesting that you put it in those terms is I am selling myself. Mm -hmm. I'm selling myself and I'm selling a succession plan. I'm selling a path to liquidity or path to retirement. Um, but yeah, first and foremost, I'm selling me. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to have the, the deepest pockets of you know, especially shareholders and financial the buyer. Partners. Right. Yeah, absolutely. To, to those, to limited partners, to business owners, mm -hmm. I'm not going to have the deepest pockets. So I have to bring some other compelling value proposition about they believe more that the business is going to be successful under my leadership. They believe more that their people are going to be taken care of better under my leadership. They believe something about me and my background is going to help distinguish and differentiate me from the dozens or hundreds of, of other cold outreaches that they get on a regular right. basis. Right. So let and me then ask I've you. got a whole similar, but slightly more targeted or slightly from a different angle story that I do tell to, to the limited partners. And when I'm selling myself to have folks interested in following my journey and get occasional check-ins from me about the kind of businesses that I'm seeing and the kind of progress that I'm making. Which I think is so important. If you want to develop like trust and credibility, having those regular check-ins, I have a, I have another group, uh, two guys who just left PE shops and they have a very, very targeted search. And so they basically, for anyone that they consider to be a potential LP, now have a monthly newsletter that just goes out and says kind of what they've done that month in searching. And, you know, if you want any more detail, they'd be happy to follow up with a phone call. And then they just follow up with phone calls anyway, just to keep that base engaged. Um, mm -hmm. And that, you know, there's many different approaches to it. That's one of the more recent ones I heard, but it's just, it's absolutely paramount. Um, I want to ask you, so you've, you've reached out to the business owner. There's some interest and um, I find this, I find this to be very tricky. You have to talk about value at some point. So how do you get to the point of talking about value? And if they're asking you to propose valuation, because they're just kind of hands in the air, haven't thought about it, how, how do you breach the subject? Because you're trying to find something that's attractive to you as a purchase price, but not insulting to them. And obviously you don't want to overpay for an asset. So it's kind of this balanced conversation. Yeah. So I think um, that's, a, that's a great question. I think in general, Every business owner, whether they're going to share that with me on the phone, uh, especially on a first phone call or not, has some kind of a number in mind. Is they've they've gotten an unsolicited offer before. They've talked with an M and A advisor. They've got you know a colleague or a friend or a friend of a friend who's in a similar industry and they know vaguely what that business sold for, or they know the kind of lifestyle that they want to provide for themselves, their family, kids, etc. I hate to cut you off, but I always find that part so funny when there's a number, but it's not connected to the business. It's just sort of mm -hmm. how they want to live thereafter. And I, I've even had people quote me based on like number of jet skis or boats that are required post transaction. <laughs> um, so it's, it's kind of calm. I didn't want to interrupt, but I just find that yeah. that separation of valuation has been interesting to me on occasion, but I'll, I'll let you go, go on. Yeah. yeah. So I've, I've seen the, you know, sometimes it is just a, a number that is built more around you know, personal lifestyle and family expectations and obligations, but as often as not, I mean, these are just because it's not in the, the high finance world, these are still savvy business people. Probably uh, so oh, explaining, yes. you know, explaining, Hey, I typically operate on a multiple of EBITDA or just to, to speak in even plainer language to say, Hey, I, I tend to try to value a business as a multiple of its pre-tax profits. And I typically live in a range of call it three to six times pre-tax profits and the, the characteristics of the business in terms of going back to those things that I talked about me looking for earlier on in, in our call, um, you know, it's quality of revenue, it's total size, it's level of customer concentration, the industry it lives in, how defensible it is relative to its peers or competitors. All of those things can make a business more or less attractive. Certainly. Um, so I, 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 love, I, tend I love to try that to bring you say, that up. I just have to go back to a comment because I love that you made it that the entrepreneurs are, are just wildly savvy. And I would say you, you generally don't know anywhere near as much as them about their business, certainly. 
um, about finance or accounting specifically, maybe, but I've generally found that the knowledge base is so profound there and you're just trying to find the same language to communicate it. Like the vocabulary changes, people refer to income statements on cash basis or accrual basis and things like that, but their, their, knowledge, their knowledge is so profound. And it's, I think one of the most insulting things you can do uh, to go in and assume that it isn't because it will, it will very quickly kill a conversation. Kill a conversation and then you may get your ass handed to you by somebody <laughs> you didn't realize was a CPA in a previous life. Right. That's right. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I try to drive to that very, very early on. Um, I've got just a handful of questions that I try to get through as I try to develop a little bit of rapport in a very first call that I've mentally allocated 10 or 15 minutes to. And if we really hit it off and all those answers to the questions are, are checking the right boxes, I'll, I'll stay on as long as they'll give me. Sure. Um, but in general, I'm trying to kill a deal or to kill a conversation as early as possible because I don't want to waste my time and I certainly don't want to waste their time. Yep. So I lay out what I'm looking for in terms of size, industry, character, revenue, and also lay out you know, valuation expectations at a very high level. And if that resonates and say, like, hey, does this sound like we're in the same ballpark? Should we keep talking? And then I hear, yes, I meet all those criteria. Let's chat. So to, or, go, to, before, but to go back to valuation quickly, when you say, here are my valuation expectations, do you apply it sort of, this is what I'm looking for in general as it relates to my search? These are the parameters as it relates to valuation? Or will you go as far as say, as it relates to your business, here's where I think valuation would fall? I think the first, the former is like a very, it's a softer way to approach it. And the, and the second's more direct. And the, and the direct approach can sometimes really backfire. And so I'm just curious. Yeah. So I, I'd say it's, it's kind of a blend of the two. Um, so typically when I'm on a first phone call with a business owner, we're not under NDA. Um, so there will be definitely and, and varying NDA being a non-disclosure agreement. Sorry. Yes. Yeah. So there, there will be tremendous variations in their level of comfort sharing information about their business. Um, so I, I tend to not be able to give a specific number in that first phone call or a range in that first phone call, but they can very easily without divulging information to me that they're not comfortable divulging, say, like, okay, I know what my tax return was like last year, my pre-tax profits were this. So they can start putting between, it together. Yeah, they can start yeah. putting it together. And if it's within the range, if we're in, if we're speaking the same language, if we're playing the same sport, whatever yeah. you know, terminology you want to use, we'll keep the conversation going. And I'll take that as my first piece of, my first indicator that we're, we're trending in the right direction. If they ask me specifically, but to get a little more granular, me? to get a little more granular on that, you're basically coming coming to the conversation and saying, "Here's kind of multiples of some measure of profitability that I'd be willing to move forward on." You don't know how profitable the business is, but the seller thinks, "Okay, well, this is how profitable I am. This is his multiples. They can put that together, and then if the conversation persists, then you guys know you're kind of playing in the same ballpark." Yeah. yeah. Okay. And then quickly after that. I do try to give them a, a firmer written indication. So as soon as we have that non-disclosure agreement signed, I will tip, and we've already had our first little chat confirm that we're basically what each other are looking for. I'll ask for three years tax returns. Mm -hmm. And then as soon as I've got that coupled with my basic understanding of how the business works, what, it, what industry it plays in, what its level of customer concentration is, all those things, um, I'll generate an IOI, an indication of interest, or basically a soft offer. Yeah. Uh, so it's not it's it's not binding in its terms, but it is as close as I can get with a very very small and limited data set to getting them. This is what I think an ultimate offer on your business is going to look like. And if we're way off and they say like, <laughs> you're you're missing a zero there buddy yeah then then we just but I, I would, I would echo that yeah. entirely I, I think one of the biggest mistakes people make is not putting something in writing in front of the other party or or giving them something to actually review the conversation stays vague for too long it just kind of goes on and on and with the number of people calling on most targets these days you i think you have to find a way to get the conversation to turn real faster um so i, I would i would echo that entirely I think yeah. that's right. And, and I've even had IOIs that I send out that have, have generated a very negative reaction, um, but that did not kill the conversation. 
and say, hey, how yeah. on earth did you, you get still get a reaction? Right? This is yeah, this is insulting. And I say, well, this is you know the information that I have on your business so far. This is these are the assumptions that I made about it. This is what I think is you know fair market multiple, something that is if you're you know, still appropriate for, for you both of us. A misunderstanding, right? If if yeah, yeah. If, if you guys are too far off, you can say, like, well, this is inf- this is off of highly limited information. Like if mm-hmm. if there's more of a conversation to have to be had here. I'm very interested in let, and let's do that. Um, yeah. I mean, there's, nice. there are certainly factors where I may not know their character of revenue. They may have a 90% recurring revenue business that I just assumed was you know, basically repeat purchase and very difficult to predict. I'd like to think that I would have that conversation before generating an IOI. Uh, but I think I've had several of those misunderstandings or kind of crosstalk with a, with a business owner about not fully being clear on what exactly their business is. And we've had significant valuation gaps yeah. because of that. And then we get that new information and offer comes up, offer comes down and we continue the conversation Listen. there. Absolutely. Um, so I had one final question for you, but are, are we missing anything? I think as we talked about, about sourcing and networking and all of that, I, did, I didn't really get into one of the one of the things that's unique to my approach. Oh, yes. We and that's absolutely the, need to talk about this. Yeah, the SDVOSB. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so we talked a little bit, and I think we, we both used the phrase something about differentiating yourself or finding your niche, finding a place that's not as heavily competitive. And something that I found for me based on my background, skill set, and interest is looking at government contracting businesses and specifically veteran-owned small business and service-disabled veteran-owned small businesses. Uh, so that's SDVOSB. It's a mouthful. I've said it <laughs> dozens, if not hundreds of times over the past couple of months. So it rolls off the tongue nicely, but it, it can trip you up otherwise. Um, uh, this makes so much sense to me because I've looked at, and we talked about this before, but I've looked at a few businesses that fall into this category. And it was it was the contracting part that just anyone on my team, we couldn't really figure out how to get comfortable. Like who are the people, who are the players? Why do they renew when, et cetera. Mm-hmm. And all of them have expiration dates and they're large chunks of revenue. And so your understanding kind of on the inside, I'll, I'll let you speak to this, but I, I just wanted to point out how from an outsider's perspective, I view this as a unique, uh, very differentiated advantage because I've been on the other side trying to understand it. So I'll let you speak to like why you do. Yeah. So I think, I mean, I'll, I'll caveat this by saying I am still not a GovCon expert. I know just enough to be dangerous and I know just enough to know that I want to know more. Mm -hmm. Uh, But I think that when you get into these specially designated businesses, you know, veteran owned, woman owned, 8A, hub zone, et cetera, these are all programs created by the federal government to advantage certain classes or certain types of business owners. And they do that by having set aside contracts, basically lower competition contracts for a percentage of of the federal government's budget that can only be bid on and can only be won by businesses meeting these certain criteria. Uh, so it's a, it's a really great, I think it's a great program in general. And I think it's a great way to have a highly defensible niche for a business, mm-hmm. uh, whether that's software development or facilities, maintenance and operation or fire suppression and inspection or construction or anything else. Um, I think it's a great way to have a bit of additional artificial defensibility to your company. But the flip side of that is these types of businesses come with pretty significant limitations on their ownership structure, management structure, and a whole set of of other factors around the businesses that box out investment by most typical players. Um, So typically private equity, yeah, private equity firms um, typically cannot invest in these types of businesses. It'd be exceptionally rare for the public markets to be invested even a traditional search fund, you know, someone who raises that initial capital um, based on their ultimate agreements with their LPs about the, the split of the economics of the company would not be able to buy one of these businesses and maintain the ownership and management requirements necessary to keep that company's designation. Mm-hmm. And often if you lose that designation, you lose the contracts that were associated with or were won because you have that designation. So you can lose... You know, in some instances, the business is 100% reliant on its status. In other instances, the business is 5 or 10% reliant on its status. Um, but there's, I think, a very unique, uh, a unique angle there for 
a woman entrepreneur or someone in a historically underutilized business zone or a veteran or service disabled veteran entrepreneur to buy one of these companies. Because in my, in my research and in my experience, um, a lot of these business owners have, and they've got a really tough time for succession planning ahead of them. Their, you know, their child may not meet the same demographic or military service or whatever characteristics that they meet. They just may not have someone who can readily take this business owner the way that a non-designated fully private sector uh, serving business can. So they face this terrible decision at some point of, I need to retire. There's no one who can buy this business from me or almost no one who can buy this business from me. Um, I've just got to shut the doors and that's going to put a dozen or two dozen people out of work. And that's terrible, but I'm 85 years old and I've been working <laughs> since I was 17 and it's, uh, it's time for me to do that. So I think this more so than, than almost any other element of, of my independent sponsor journey is, is just this true win-win of, you know, someone else is faced with potentially closing the doors or, you know, having to work significantly longer than they intend to with a minority buyout situation. And then I have the ability to buy what is for me a, a very attractive, high quality of revenue, good size, highly defensible company at a better valuation than uh, is otherwise available just based yeah. on the, the market dynamics and the scarcity of buyers. The buyer universe. And yeah, you're uniquely qualified to be that buyer, yeah. which is very cool. Yeah. And there's all, all kinds of things we can get into about understanding the government contracting cycle and understanding the defensibility of certain contracts. And yes, yeah, sometimes it's sometimes the character revenue is, is very lumpy and it's very project driven. Other times there are, are companies that have phenomenal recurring revenue and they're exclusively or almost exclusively multi-year, you know, three, five, seven year service contracts that they have won on rebid two or three times in a row that you expect to continue. And sure. you can basically treat those as in, in some ways more reliable or more defensible than a purely commercial serving uh, private sector company with recurring revenue that only has one year contract that auto renews. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's very interesting. Having a unique advantage is kind of everything right now. So, so let me ask you, you're, you're on this path. Do you think about this? This is kind of my final question. Um, I think uh, a lot of people, they go out and they look for their own business to acquire, and then they want to be in that in an evergreen capacity, continue doing bolt-ons and just make the largest platform, right? And there's a lot of great examples. You gave the example of Robert Reese earlier, um, or there are individuals who kind of look- Richard for, Reese. Richard Reese. Richard, yeah. Sorry, yeah. I can, uh, I can jump in and tell that. Yeah, tell please. please. Story I, think it's the, I think it's a fascinating worthwhile. story. Yeah. So I've, I've met Richard Reese two or three times at this point. I, I won't say that I, that I know him. He probably wouldn't recognize me off the street. Um, but he, I think, is one of the handful of examples of a really lights out entrepreneurship through acquisition or independent sponsor uh, professional journey. So if I'm remembering correctly, and I'm sure somebody on YouTube is going to fact check me, um, he went to HBS and ultimately set out to, to buy a company. And he bought this small, I think do, basically a document storage warehousing and shredding company in upstate New York, if I remember correctly. And he was commuting back and forth. And this was probably a 500K EBITDA company, relatively small by, um, by our standards now, maybe not quite so small when he did it. And he ultimately became incredibly, incredibly acquisitive in, in his in his entrepreneurial journey. And so I think over, got over, up to a point. Over the arc of his acquisition, it's, I think you mentioned 3 million to 3 billion. Is that, is that right? Yes, something, something in that vein. I think he was maybe at a 500K, even to like 3 million revenue company uh, to begin with. And over the course of several decades, I mean, he modernized the service offering. I think they got into digital document storage. They got into you know, digitization and physical document removal. They, they diversified their offerings, but he also bought uh, a ton of similar aligned, similarly aligned companies, ultimately getting up to, I think, an acquisition every other day or something in their most uh, acquisitive period. 
Wow. And yeah, revenues exceeded three billion. Uh, the company that he bought, uh, people will maybe recognize, haven't seen some trucks going by on the road, is Iron Mountain. Um, he took that through its journey to go public. Um, I believe he retired and then came back for a period of time. But this is just a a story of a small, really small acquisition made by a, a hungry and hardworking young entrepreneur that ultimately just turned into this absolute behemoth and has has of course set up Richard and his family for you know, long term success and has enabled him to to do lots of things in in the charitable world has enabled him to do I think lots of investing lots of board advising and, and lots of other things. So that that's, uh, so that's, that's kind of a perfect explanation because that's my, so my question is, do you see yourself wanting to try something like that? The buy and build acquisitions all on one platform, or do you think of this as I need to go make a couple acquisitions on my own, uh, show some success, raise capital and transition to the private equity fund model, which, which gets you more excited? Because I think one is more, you're an operator, you're an entrepreneur, and you're always scaling the same entity. And the other really becomes two functions, one of raising capital and one of deploying capital. And I think they appeal to people very differently. Yeah. So I'd say, uh, I don't think either is really in the cards if they're coming <laughs> the next Richard Rees or, uh, or starting my own fund. But thematically, I lean much more toward the former. Uh, the, way that I, the way that I communicate this to business owners and intermediaries and the way that I think about this myself is this is likely going to be whatever acquisition I make, whatever company I acquire and move into as its next leader is going to be what I do for the rest of my career. Um, I'm not uh, just, as I've explained my background, I'm not a deal guy by trade. I don't have the experience in raising capital and deploying capital that say someone who spent a couple of years in banking and then the next decade plus in, in private equity has. I certainly have the skill set to consummate a deal and the interest to, to do that. But my skill set and interest lies much more in operations and being a leader, setting culture, identifying new strategic opportunities. Um, so I can't, I'm never going to sign, you know, a promise in blood that I'm going to never sell this company sure. that I acquire, but I do only try to engage with companies and certainly only make offers on companies that I could see myself happily running for decades. So like, am I going to be, do I see a path to being happy and fulfilled, both personally and professionally um, by being in this company and growing it, pivoting it, adding things to it, uh, whatever it may be for a very long period of time. I don't think in the you know, three to five year or maybe seven year fun life cycle yeah. as that's what's, what's driving my, my decision-making. Well, hopefully, t- But exactly t- as t- you t- said, there, there are definitely people who, who fall into one of the other camps. I think so. Uh, you yeah. know, even without being the being the Richard Reese's right. uh, of the world or the Assurians, um, there there are people who are are very happy and very successful running their businesses at a smaller but still tremendously successful scale for decades. Yeah. And there are others who make an acquisition. the The timing is right based on the changes that they made over a relatively short period of time to sell that company and make more acquisitions and then ultimately transition into more of a family office type structure or That's private good. equity fund type structure. Yeah. Well, hopefully when you're running the next Iron Mountain in 15 <laughs> years from now, they'll look back on this interview. <laughs> I'd say he never thought it could, <laughs> I mean, never say never, but I think if you, if you set your sights on oh, of course. You know, emulating a very particular path or um, expecting to have some, pretty phenomenal level of uh, a financial outcome, you're, you're not setting yourself up for success. I think if yeah. you setting yourself have, up for systems and processes over goals, I think is yeah. generally the way to go about it, especially in this world. I think uh, systems and processes over goals. And then also just trusting that the, you know, the financial component will come if you've done your homework and done your diligence and, and put in the effort and sprinkled in the right amount of luck. Yeah. And as long as you're solving for, you know, the things that I think are going to, are going to better drive happiness. You know, your ability to have community engagement, your ability to shift the direction of an entire organization, taking back some of that personal and professional agency so that you can try to live the life that you want to live. I think those are more tangible and achievable goals. And I kind of trust on the back end that the, the financial stuff is going to work out. 
And it does take some luck. I had a very self-deprecating partner I worked with for a while who, whenever something worked out well and someone congratulated him on it, he'd say uh, every single time, blind squirrels find nuts. You know, that was it. (laughs) Yeah. But uh, Well, Mason, thank you. This has been awesome. Um, Look forward to the response online. Really appreciate you taking the time and uh, look forward to circling back when you close your first deal. Yeah. Thanks for talking with me. And hopefully that uh, that circle back will come sooner than. That's right. That's right. We'll we'll come soon. Well, thanks, Mason. All right. Cheers.